in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, and unlike a normal person's reaction, which would be like, get me out of here, I never want to go back, I was like, yes. like the most important body of water in the world that no one knew anything about. There are no roads and there are no phones. So the access point to these communities is over the water. What we do is to play the role of the regional hospital by bringing the regional hospital actually to the region. If I um, had to think of one word <laughs> that summarizes the Lake Tanganyika Basin, I would say sort of intense. Lake Tanganyika is one of the most remote locations in Sub-Saharan Africa. It's literally right in the heart of Sub-Saharan Central Africa and the Great Lakes. It's the longest lake in the world in between four countries, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Tanzania, Burundi, and Zambia. The geography around Lake Tanganyika has contributed to its isolation because it's surrounded by tall mountains and there's an escarpment on the Tanzanian side which makes it very difficult just physically right to get to Lake Tanganyika and then the infrastructure around the lake is very very poor so from a road access perspective there really isn't any and also from a mobile phone coverage perspective there isn't comprehensive mobile phone coverage either. So if you take these physical characteristics and then overlay the insecurity that has taken place in the Great Lakes region in general, you have a, a place that is both highly strategic from a natural resources perspective, but heretofore has been basically inaccessible. The whole western border of Lake Tanganyika is mineral-rich eastern Congo. So I think it's pretty obvious, and a lot of these um, discoveries are not new. We, you know, we know that they're there. Um, so you have all the mining issues that are right out there, you know, obvious, have been around for a while. Um, but we have some, some new issues which are on the table, and that is around oil and gas. So a lot of people are aware of this sort of East Central African oil boom, but may not know the actual details of what that oil boom um, is about. And, and, and the Albertine Graben, which is where Lake Tanganyika is, is considered sort of you know, one new mother load of petroleum. So that is you know, a very active issue right now, but I think it's very important to contextualize that amongst the other natural resources that are, you know, sort of from a biodiversity and clean water perspective. Uh, Lake Tanganyika has almost a fifth of the world's available fresh water in it. Um, 
And so from a water security standpoint, that is reason alone why the Lake Tanganyika Basin should be considered a highly strategic area. Then when you um, add on some of the issues of biodiversity and some of the forests, you know, the issues of climate change that are getting much more attention, what's fascinating to me about the Lake Tanganyika Basin is that when people talk about things like the food, energy, water nexus, et cetera, you know, you can't look at a better example than the Lake Tanganyika Basin that makes it manifestly clear how interconnected all of these issues really are and that you cannot go in one direction only without thinking about all of these other components. Around the few population centers, you know, there may be electricity, there may be cellular phone coverage, but for the majority of the lakeside communities that don't live in a population center around Lake Tanganyika, we're talking about, you know, real lack of development. You know, people live in, in mud thatch huts, you know, people are subsistence farmers or fishermen, you know, the access to education is very, very limited, the access to healthcare is very, very, very limited, and so you see um, some of the worst human development indicators in this part of the world because the aid and development space has not reached this area either. The health issues that, that are present in the Lake Tanganyika Basin range from sort of the infectious diseases that everyone thinks about to other problems that, again, people may not think about. Um, so infectious diseases. Uh, you have malaria, which um, in other parts of the world, the aid and development space has been very successful in decreasing rates of malaria and malaria mortality. Um, that isn't the case in, in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, where it is one of the main contributors to under five mortality, for example. Measles, diarrheal diseases in infants and small children, you know, cholera is very common around Lake Tanganyika. Uh, parasitic diseases are very, very common. Um, but then you have diseases that are surgical diseases, if you will, that people don't really think about. One of those is obstructed labor. And one reason why there's such a high maternal mortality rate is that women in the Lake Tanganyika Basin are disproportionately suffering from obstruct obstructed labor. Um, and then you have things like burns. So burns are often, you know, surgical problems in the sense that in order to debride and graft a burn, um, in order to save, say, function of an arm, right? Like, this is really essential. And burns are incredibly common because there's no electricity, right? So people are using open flames for cooking and for light. And so the, the number of accidents that children have with open flames um, is quite high. So when you think about the implication of, of what that might mean for a child if they become not only disfigured but lose function um, because of a severe burn, you know, that, per that person's life is, is basically over because they can't work. So you see the whole range of, of medical problems that are there that traditionally fall in sort of the community health, public health space, and then things that are really um, sort of more technically advanced and specific. I mean, and I've seen plenty of people who have cancer in the Lake Tanganyika Basin as well. So that's, I think, a really important point that people look at the developing world and they say, oh, they have malaria and worms and stuff like that. But they also have <laughs> all the other diseases too. <laughs> because if you live, right, if you, if you live through your childhood and, um, and you're exposed to all the other things that humans are exposed to in life, you also have a risk of these other kinds of non-communicable, you know, and surgical diseases. So it's not only about things like malaria. It's also about that but it's about a whole other list of required services. In 
many sub-Saharan countries, the organization of ministries of health are relatively similar. You have dispensaries slash health clinics that are the first point of entry into the health system that serve rural to ultra-rural populations. And then um, what happens is, is that if patients need more, they get referred to a district or general level hospital and thence on to a regional level hospital. And the regional level hospital is responsible for the larger unit where you're sort of ensuring supply chain of, of, of medications and medical goods to the periphery. You're ensuring appropriate training um, of healthcare workers. You are the referral partner for patients who need a higher level of care. Um, etc. Well, in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, that system totally breaks down because the dispensaries and the health centers that dot Lake Tanganyika and are the plateaus around Lake Tanganyika cannot reach the general or regional level facilities. They're literally too far away. Our method really is to use the lake as the highway. There is no highway, there are no roads, and there are no phones. So the access point to these communities is over the water. So what we do is to play the role of the regional hospital by bringing the regional hospital actually to the region. Um, and so we interact with the dispensaries and the health centers to help them carry out their mission of primary prevention and primary care um, and are sort of working towards a position where we can be the referral partner for patients who need a higher level of care. And so what we do now is a mixture of um, sort of facilities improvements, whether that's something like solar lighting, or putting in a communication system because there's no cell phone coverage. Um, we've currently developed a very um, interesting electronic medical record that works on a very novel hardware system taking into account these severe bandwidth restrictions and that kind of thing. The hospital ship itself is intended to kind of be that um, organizing principle, if you will, in the basin, that if you establish an actual communications and supply chain between all of these areas, supply chain means something broader than just, do you have the right medicines? Do you have the right IV tubing? Things like that. It also means, do you have the right training? Do you have the right you know, refresher going on? You know, are you doing professional education um, and advancement amongst, you know, local healthcare workers? Um, so the idea of, of the regional hospital on a ship is, is the organizing principle around which this idea of upward trajectory and improvement, you know, wraps itself around you know, that concept, because it's there and able to engage in all of these activities and ensure supply chains and communications in a way that, you know, there is no other system that can do that right now. Obstructed labor is basically a medical way of saying the baby gets stuck on the way out. And why do babies get stuck on the way out? Um, there are a number of factors that contribute to risk of obstructed labor. Um, some of them have to do with the age of, of the pregnant person. You know, is she a woman or is she a girl? Does she have a mature pelvis or does she have an immature pelvis? Is she physically small? Is she big? Has she had prenatal care? Has she had the right kind of support um, and oversight of of healthy growth of the fetus? Um, and is she going to deliver in an area where there are trained healthcare professionals that know the kinds of maneuvers to assist vaginal delivery and who know when you have to move to a cesarean section f because of safety of the baby and safety for the mother? Um, in the Lake Tanganyika Basin, we don't have any of that, right? We have the perfect storm of risk factors. 
you know, girls um, get pregnant very early. There is no availability of family planning slash contraception. There's, so there's an access problem. To a certain extent, it's an education problem um, that girls are not necessarily in school. Um, they marry early. They become pregnant early. And so then you have this issue of, you know, is your body physically mature enough to, you know, have a baby right now? And sometimes the answer to that is no. Um, and then, you know, you couple sort of the risk factors of having a baby that might be slightly too big for your body um, with no sort of, you know, technical capabilities to deal with that very situation. And really what we're talking about is, is there a safe cesarean section available in a timely way that can not only save the life of the mother, but save the life of the, of the infant? Um, in the absence of that, when a baby gets stuck, the baby almost invariably dies. Um, and then if the woman herself does not die, um, this is where obstetric fistula occurs because you literally, your, your baby dies and is putting pressure on certain organs inside your body and the pressure of that baby inside um, essentially injures um, some of the, the organs of these women and creates these abnormal connections inside the body, resulting in what is this incredibly shameful, horrible injury, um, whereby the you know, girls are basically leaking urine and or feces uncontrollably. And, and literally because people are disgusted by them, that is really the reason, they are shunned from their communities. Um, often their husbands will leave them, often they're driven out of their villages, or conversely, they spend their entire lives you know, tucked into the corner of a hut. Um, I mean, literally their lives sort of effectively come to an end. Um, and so this is a horrible problem that is better dealt with by preventing the upstream causes <laughs> of obstetric fistula, but at the same time, it can be repaired ex post. You know, most women who have these injuries with the right kind of treatment can be repaired and restored to a normal life, but you have to have the access in order to, to give that treatment. We have um, treated women in, on the Congo side of the lake and the Tanzanian side of the lake who suffer from obstetric fistula. We created a team of people um, and we spent many months recruiting patients and again, hoping to create a realistic sense of what they should expect, um, that they can trust us. It's a very um, intimidating problem to come forward with, right? So even making people in the community feel like they would want to come forward and identify themselves as somebody that had this problem takes time. So we spent a lot of time sort of doing community education um, about the nature of, of the injury disease itself. And then we essentially created this group of women who needed surgical treatment and we provided that surgical treatment for them. On the Congo side, we, have ha we had a couple of patients who after their successful surgery and also understanding the educational component to it um, and what she would have to do, say, if she wanted to have a family, um, we've had a couple of patients who have successfully been pregnant and delivered babies safely. Now they have their children, they're, they're repaired, and they're having a normal life. So, I mean, that is probably as good as it gets. <laughs> um, but I think there, there are other stories about obstetric fistula that I think are really important, um, and that is that 
we occasionally see women who are so injured or where repairs have been attempted, but in, in, in not the correct technical way. Um, basically, physically have a, um, a problem that is very complex um, from a surgical perspective, where right now we just don't have the technical capability to treat these kinds of women with very, very complex fistulae. Um, but having said that, we still feel that we can help these women. And we had a woman like that during this fistula outreach that we did. Uh, the woman really didn't have an injury that was amenable to the repair with the technology that we had at that moment. Nonetheless, we were able to help her with the management of the problem, with certain kinds of, you know, just goods. I mean, even as basic, do you have, you know, a few pairs of underwear? Do you have pads? Right? Do you have a way of protecting you know, the mattress that you sleep on? You know, things like that that are so minimal um, that make a huge difference for women who are trying to manage this problem. And I think that it was incredibly empowering for her to be around other women who had the problem and feel that she could contribute um, to helping take care of some of these women, that she was sort of learning basic nursing skills. She didn't feel like a pariah anymore. She felt like she had a community of women um, that weren't going to ostracize her anymore. And I think so even though she wasn't repaired, she came out of that experience, I think, a much more you know, strong and resilient person and, and sort of able to face you know, her issue in a way that was much more constructive than it had been before. So I think that those people are almost more important because you can't fix everybody. And those people need a way to live their lives too. So, you know, she is, uh, you know, she is the patient that, you know, almost interested me the most in a way. You know, could we do right by her? And if we could do right by her, then we knew that we were, you know, on to the kind of right path. I think that, that the Lake Tanganyika Basin is a place that is, you know, uniquely suited to being, you know, to having its story be told in pictures, so to speak. Um, and so for me, you know, people understanding the vastness of, the, of, this, of this body of water, the, the mountains, you know, what the facilities look like, you know, what the barriers are, but also being able to meet real people who have stories and who are interesting and have things to say and can also tell their own stories. You know, I don't want to talk for the people in the basin. I want to, you know, enable a platform for people to talk about their own experiences. And so film in, in that area is a very powerful medium. If I could say my fantasy cash figure, my fantasy cash figure is somebody out there is like, I understand the geopolitical significance of this place. I understand the humanitarian issues. I understand the environmental issues, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, I get what you're doing, not only from a health systems building perspective, but from like a building a platform for the right kind of development in the Lake Tanganyika Basin. Here's a hundred million dollar endowment. Build the ship and run it and do what you think is right, right? <laughs> Instead of, you know, running all around the world, essentially, you know, asking people and organizations for money. Right? That's what I would like. I would love that. <laughs> you know? And I would take any other version of that, you know, down the line. <laughs> right? <laughs>
you know, building and infrastructure in certain parts of the world. Well, in a kind of Western-centric um, concept of the thing, that means that you build bricks and mortar on a piece of ground and you build a bunch of roads, right, that connect it to stuff. Well, it's not only the Lake Tanganyika Basin where the waterway is a much more natural supply chain. There, you know, if you conservatively estimate the number of people who live in coastal communities, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people who, from a supply chain and access perspective, probably would be better reached with some kind of water-based system. And it doesn't necessarily mean that the water-based system has to look like the water-based system we're designing, but it could. And I think it's this idea, and, and, and especially with climate change and these issues about coastal communities and resiliency against these sort of changing patterns, um, the idea that you can create a more robust system that actually reaches people and delivers the services that they need, I think is a very intriguing idea. Um, and that I think we need to open our minds to this idea that, that you know, access and supply chain issues require a certain amount of out-of-the-box thinking. And that in a changing world as well, you know, this idea, this static idea that we've had for a long time, you know, may be, you know, not only inappropriate for water-based communities, but becoming less and less, you know, the general go-to paradigm anyway. So that is sort of, I think that there are a lot of lessons learned in terms of, you know, supply chain and access and working in transboundary regions. And, and that kind of thing, you know, how you create regional cooperation. You know, people talk all the time about, you know, regional economic blocks and all that sort of stuff. But really, what does it mean to actually coordinate, you know, activities um, in a functional way? So for us, you know, we've learned some really interesting things about what it means to traverse basically four, you know, boundaries. Um, and create environments where there's dialogue between, you know, all of their, the regional counterparts. Specifically with respect to the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, there really is one narrative and one narrative alone that, you know, stands out, which is this is a failed state, totally dysfunctional basket case. You know, you can't do anything there. It's, you know, the only thing that people ever do is, you know, rape and kill each other, et cetera. You know, and I don't, look, you know, the bad things that have happened in Congo are terrible and bad, but that is not, that's not the only thing that's going on there. And, you know, I think that what people who, who come with me into the basin are always very surprised to discover is that, especially on the Congo side of the lake, okay? Not in spite of the Congo side of the lake, but literally especially on the Congo side of the lake. Even in places where the facilities are crumbling around them, you can find such dedicated professionalism amongst healthcare workers, for example. So here's this nurse in the bush, right, with this crumbling facility, with no communication, no running water, right, no electricity, who is like trying to, you know, hold back a tsunami like this of problems, who is so professional and dedicated and sophisticated in a certain way. And these are words that people never use about the Congo. And yet I see these kinds of people all the time. So not only do I think there's a lack of awareness about a strong technocratic and professional class that exists in, in the Congolese diaspora that would be so thrilled to come back to Congo and participate and make the country better? There is an indigenous, present technocratic professional class that is there, you know, hibernating maybe in many places but is there, the capacity, the human capital, 
in DRC is so impressive to me that I feel like, you know, it, it, it becomes crazy then in my mind that we can characterize this massive country, right, the largest country in sub-Saharan Africa with nine, you know, borders, right, and 70 million people that we're just going to write it off and be like, oh, basket case, right? That's clearly not the whole story. And until we start telling the other side of the story, sorry, where is the hope? You know, why are we to do anything? Why are we to engage if it's only this story of negativity and there's nothing else, right, that the country has to offer? I think the Congo has so much to offer and we have to begin to engage with it in a very different kind of way. I grew up in, in Chicago and uh, I was interested in many things from the time I was a teenager. I was interested in sub-Saharan politics for a long time. I was very interested in the Great Lakes region from the time that I was, I was young. So my being interested in these issues is not new in my life. Uh, I um, ended up going to medical school and business school um, at the University of Chicago. Um, I did that um, as a single mother. I had my son when I was at university. I uh, did a surgical residency, and at a certain point during my residency, there were um, a number of factors that all sort of coalesced at the same time, which essentially led me to do this professional 180-degree turn um, away from academic surgery to the Lake Tanganyika Basin and working on this sort of health systems building, sort of smart development in the Lake Tanganyika Basin project. So when I was a teenager, I read about, you know, the Victorian explorers trekking from Zanzibar to Lake Tanganyika. And I was very interested in the history of the Congo. So Lake Tanganyika really is the meeting point of all of these different regions of Africa. It really is the heart of Sub-Saharan Africa. And you have the East African influences, the West African influences, and the Southern African influences that all sort of come together in this, in this way station, right, which is the longest lake in the world. So when I was, you know, 15, right, it seemed like, wow, what an what a, what a adventure. <laughs> what an interesting place, I, you know, I want to go there and have an adventure, right? Um, then later on in my life, before I went to medical school, for example, I taught introductory biology for a little while. And then I rediscovered the Lake Tanganyika Basin from a, from a biodiversity, sort of microevolution, a biology perspective. And, and, and so then, um, when I had an opportunity to go there, I had um, a very dear Tanzanian friend. And I said, he was like, let's go on vacation in Tanzania. I said, okay, but I want to go to Lake Tanganyika. And he said to me, girl, I'm not going there. That's the middle of nowhere. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to go to Lake Tanganyika anyway. And when I went there, um, basically, we were on a boat, and I, like a typhoon happened. The airstrip where I was supposed to be picked up was washed away. So I was stuck in the Lake Tanganyika Basin. And unlike a normal person's reaction, which would be like, get me out of here. I never want to go back. I was like, yes. <laughs> Um, because that experience, I really was able to see the significant populations that live around Lake Tanganyika, understand the real transportation and communication barriers that existed in the place. You know, this, you know, I felt like I was standing on the Tanzanian side, looking across at the Congo side, and sort of saying, oh, this is where a lot of the issues really have played themselves out. Right? This is a very interesting access point into you know, this kind of complex you know, geopolitical slash humanitarian emergency.
that's going on here. And also, by the way, look at you know, this strategic, massive body of freshwater. And how is it that no one is really talking about this place? How come no one talks about Lake Tanganyika? That's odd to me. So I had, you know, so from that experience, it sort of, you know, became clear that, you know, at least the way I felt about it was this is like the most important body of water in the world that no one knew anything about. And so I thought, hmm, you know, what should I do about that? You know, and, you know, life is full of surprises anyway, right? And, and there are various twists and turns that people, you know, experience in their lives. And it just so happened that, you know, the compass pointed at Lake Tanganyika for me. So I heeded it. <laughs> It's a beautiful place. I mean, Lake Tanganyika is so beautiful. I mean, the water is beautiful, the mountains are beautiful, the people are beautiful. Um, it's a physically dramatic, beautiful place. And if I um, had to think of one word <laughs> that summarizes the Lake Tanganyika place, I would say it's sort of intense, right? That there is sort of intense beauty and it's sort of intense possibility. There's something that's very sort of peaceful and deep and ancient about it. But at the same time, you do have, you know, the sort of intensely bad things, right? Like it's bad that we have the under five mortality rate that we have. It's bad that we have the maternal mortality rate that we have. It's bad that there is so much poverty and suffering. And it's bad that, you know, there are pockets of, you know, very, you know, extreme insecurity. So it's sort of this place where you have, you know, a series of conflicting emotions, you know, kind of all the time. So that's sort of an intense experience. <laughs>